How do most kings ascend to the throne these days? How, do, how are they given the, the highest, most prestigious position in the land? The reality is it's because their fathers die. It's not because they have earned the right, uh, because they've accomplished some remarkable feat on behalf of a grateful people. It's not because they've conquered an evil foe uh, or brought the nation to some position of prominence. No, most kings in the modern era, are, they are the victors of happenstance. They fall into it. They just happen to be born into the right family uh, at the right time and in the right order. But as we consider the kingship of the Lord Jesus Christ uh, in Matthew chapter 2, we'll we'll note that a very different picture emerges. Uh, Yes, Jesus is is the one who comes from the house and lineage uh, of David, but we recognize that no one has sat on the throne of David for over four or five hundred years. And yet here are the Magi, uh, seeking the one born king of, of the Jews. And so Matthew writes to prove that Jesus is the real deal. That he's not just a, a late but lucky arrival. Uh, he wants to, to paint a, 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 a graphic portrait for us in chapter 2, in verses tw- uh, 13 through 23, helping us to understand that, that Jesus did not fall into this position. God was at work. Uh, God was the one who brought forth Jesus Christ at this particular time, in this particular place, to serve his plans and his purposes. He wants us to understand that Jesus is the king who was guarded and guided by God according to his eternal plans and purposes. Jesus didn't stumble haphazardly into this position. Uh, his parents didn't manipulate circumstances to, for the benefit of their child, for the benefit of their family. No, God put Christ there. Even as a little child, when he was vulnerable, when he was defenseless, when he couldn't make decisions on his own, independent of his parents. No, God guarded him and guided him for his plans and his purposes. So with that in mind, let's open our Bibles once again to Matthew's Gospel. Again, this this morning we're going to look at chapter 2. We're going to focus our attention on verses 13 to 23. And in doing so, we'll discover that Jesus is the king who was guarded and guided by God according to his plans and his purposes. So having said that, let's stand for the reading of God's word together. We'll begin at chapter 2, verse 13, and continue reading to the end of the chapter. This is the word of the Lord, the inspired text. Now when they, this is the Magi, had gone, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up. Take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to destroy him. So Joseph got up and took the child and his mother while it was still night, and they left for Egypt. He remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Out of Egypt, I called my son. Then when Herod saw that he had been tricked by the Magi, he became very enraged and sent and slew all the male children who were in Bethlehem and all its vicinity from two years older and under according to the time which he had determined from the Magi. Then what had been spoken through Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping and and great mourning. Rachel weeping for her children, and she refused to be comforted because they were no more. But when Herod died, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and and go into the land of Israel, for those who sought the child's life are dead. 
So Joseph got up and took the child and his mother and came into the land of Israel. And when he had heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Then, after being warned by God in a dream, he left for the regions of Galilee. And he came and lived in a city called Nazareth. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophets. He shall be called a Nazarene. Let's bow together and ask the Lord to bless our time of study. Our great God and Heavenly Father, we come recognizing that your Son is indeed the King of kings and Lord of lords. We acknowledge that you have given him all authority in heaven and on earth. And so, Father, our desire this morning is to to know and to serve him better. So we ask that you would minister to our hearts and minds, that you would, your spirit would be at work uh, illuminating the text before us so that we might be the, the disciples that you have called us to be. We pray this in the name of of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray this for his namesake. Amen. Thank you, brothers and sisters. Please be seated. Today's passage can be divided, I think, into three sections. And I think there's a good reason why it can be divided in that way. It can be divided that way uh, because of the geography, if you want to put it that way, that's represented in the text. There's three main areas that are, are focused on Uh, in the text, and three prophecies related to the events that take place in uh, those localities. Uh, Matthew is going to cite, he is going to allude to a number of Old Testament texts, and he, he does that more than any of the other gospel writers, more than any of his contemporaries. That's because he's writing to a Jewish audience. He's writing to them, and he is using their own text uh, to support the claims that he is making. Uh, he, he, he recognizes that these people are well acquainted with the prophecies surrounded, surrounding the life and ministry of the Messiah. And so he is going to take and, and focus on three prophecies in this small, narrow section of his text. And he will do so to demonstrate the legitimacy of Christ's kingship. Again, Mary and Joseph, they didn't orchestrate the events around the life of Christ so that he might fit the royal mold. No, God is actively involved, particularly in the early years of Jesus' life, guarding and guiding him according to heaven's plans and purposes. And so we're going to see that mirrored in the events that take place in Egypt, in Bethlehem, and then in Nazareth uh, as well. So our narrative begins uh, in verses 13, 14, and 15 with the escape to Egypt. The escape to Egypt. Uh, and the incident in question here transpires almost immediately after the, uh, the Magi depart from the scene. We're told that on the very same night, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. And you'll remember that this wasn't the first time that this had happened. Uh, the angel appeared to Joseph first in, um, first in chapter 1, uh, where he instructed this humble carpenter to, to marry his betrothed, to marry Mary. And he said he was to do this because the child that was conceived in him was of or in her, was of the Holy Spirit. He told Joseph to do this because that child would save his people from their sins. Well, apart from verse 13 uh, in the text before us, uh, God will use the angel to speak at least two more times in the course of chapter 2. We need to understand that this is not normal. This is not your standard fare. In the opening chapter, opening verses of the epistle to the Hebrews, we're told that God spoke in many portions and in many ways. 
in the past, but that in these last days he has spoken to us through his son. That means that God was working in, in, in a plethora of different ways, in special ways in the past, particularly in those early days of, of Jesus' life. But we shouldn't expect him to communicate in those ways to us. Jesus has given the full and final revelation through his apostles. In fact, Peter tells us that we have a more sure word now that Christ has spoken. And so we shouldn't be looking to our own dreams, our own ideas to guide us. We should be looking at the established text, at God's written, inspired word. But here we see that God did speak to Joseph. He spoke through an angel, a, a, a message. He gave him a message, a message that was clear. Look at the second half of verse 13. The angel said, get up, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. This message is delivered with a sense of urgency. You'll note that the dialogue, it's not, long it's not drawn out so it's crisp it's clear it's commanding get up and go flee go to Egypt because your son's life is in danger you'll note that Joseph's response here is immediate he doesn't wait to discuss the matter with Mary he doesn't you know he doesn't call a family meeting to you know let's Let's wrestle with this, you know, what this actually means, what this should look like. You'll notice that he doesn't delay until he's gathered the necessary provisions. He's, he's not going to plot their journey on a map, noting how far they can go each day, you know, where the appropriate rest spots are. No. The text tells us that Joseph got up and took the child and his mother while it was still night, and he left for Egypt. We might be tempted to think that this was a bad idea. After all, I think most of us would associate Egypt with enslavement, wouldn't we? And that is true to a point. But we also need to remember that Egypt was a place of deliverance, a place of safety, a place of security. And that was the place where J Jacob's family fled in order to avoid famine and starvation. It's there that they were reunited with another Joseph, one whom God raised up in order to preserve many alive. And that's what's being done right now. In Egypt, it's actually a good choice. Egypt was relatively close. It was about 75 miles uh, south of, of Bethlehem. I mean, it's going to be a difficult journey. Mary is, you know, their child is still small. Uh, they got to get everything together and, and just go. But it's relatively close. And even though it's a Roman province... It's a province that lies outside the jurisdiction of Herod the Great. Herod is not going to be able to follow them into this Egyptian territory. Not only that, but it was during the, the intertestamental period that Alexander the Great established Alexandria. He renamed the city after himself. He reestablished uh, Alexandria as a safe haven, as a place of asylum for the Jewish people. It became a place of security for them, a place of opportunity for the sons of Abraham. It, it was there that the Hebrew scriptures had been translated uh, into the common language of the people, into Greek. And by the time of Christ, the city of Alexandria boasted a population of a, about one million Jews. Not just the other people, one million Jews. This was a prominent Jewish location, a place where these people could be nourished and fed, uh, who could still seek to study the law and to share that uh, with those around them. 
Well, Joseph and his family would remain in Egypt probably for at least two, if not three or four years. They stayed in foreign land. And they were able to do so because they were living off the treasures that had been provided to them by the Magi. It's only upon the death of Herod, around 4 BC, that they pack their bags and they start heading home. And Matthew tells us that this happened so that what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet would be fulfilled. And that prophecy being, out of Egypt, I called my son. In saying this, Matthew is quoting Hosea chapter 11, verse 1. While written by a prophet, the text itself is not a prophecy per se. It's a historical account of God's past dealings with the nation of Israel. So how are we to understand the text? The answer really hinges on your interpretation, your understanding of the word fulfill. At its core, uh, the, 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 the word basically means to complete or to establish, and yet as the gospel writers employ this particular term throughout the course of their writing, and Matthew in particular, they, they seem to use the term a little bit more broadly. John Walvoord maintains that the, the term is used in at least five different ways in the gospel of Matthew. Uh, sometimes it will point to something that fits the mold, uh, something that provides the, the epitome or the best representation of what's happening. Uh, sometimes it refers to an action that w- began in the past but th- is now completed at the particular time. And that seems to be what's going on here. What Matthew seems to be intimating here is that Jesus fits the pattern of God's chosen people. He's the climax. He's the highest point of that representation. We understand that Israel was was God's adopted son, but his real son, his only begotten son, the son in whom he is well pleased, is Jesus Christ himself. We understand that Israel was delivered from Egypt, but Jesus Christ is the deliverer who will come from Egypt. Israel's baptism in the Red Sea, uh, her 40 years of tempting or, or temptation or, or testing in the wilderness, uh, the fact that she is given the law on Mount Sinai, all of these things are going to be mirrored in the first seven chapters of Matthew. Just as Israel is baptized, Jesus is baptized. Uh, just as Israel was tempted, Jesus will be tempted for 40 days. Uh, Just as the people are given the law on Mount Sinai, Jesus is going to give the law in the Sermon on the Mount. There's a pattern that's being relayed here. And Matthew's purpose in drawing our attention to these things is to show that Jesus has been appointed has been appointed by God to be all that the nation of Israel should have been. He wants them to understand that Jesus, as part of God's eternal plan and purpose, he succeeded where they failed. And he has succeeded for them. Jesus experienced all that Israel experienced. He understood their, the difficulties they faced. He sympathized with their struggles. But he never wavered. He never succumbed. He never strayed in his mission. Because he's a faithful king. One who can be relied on when all others falter. Having examined then the escape to to Egypt, we now shift our attention to the senseless slaughter that takes place in Bethlehem. In verses 16, 17, and 18, Matthew gives us a glimpse of what happens in the aftermath of Uh, of Joseph's departure. He shows us what takes place in David's city. Uh, Look at the text. Beginning verse 16. Then when Herod saw 
that he had been tricked. Tricked by the Magi, he became very enraged. The term that's actually being used here is specific. It's used in the passive sense. Usually you would think it would be used in the active sense that he brought this about. But no, the idea here is that there's a complete loss of control. That this man is utterly, at this point, mindless. He is so enraged, he's so caught up by what has taken place, that he can't help himself. He's very enraged, and he sent and he slew all the male children who were in Bethlehem, and all in its facility, from two years old and under, according to the time which had been determined by the Magi. Now you need to understand that skeptics have really questioned this account, and they have done so because it's really, it, it seems to be that Matthew is the only person writing at this particular point in time who, who references this particular event. Everyone else is going to come after him. Uh, everyone else will seem to rely on his account, and so they wonder, how is it that this really took place? If such a feat actually occurred, surely others would have written about it. I mean, this is an atrocity of all kinds of atrocities. And yet we need to understand that Herod's actions at Bethlehem, as heinous as they are in their own right, they pale in comparison to his larger crimes. I mean, we need to remember that Bethlehem was not a big city. Uh, it wasn't a bustling metropolis. Uh, it, it didn't have a large population. It was a small hamlet, a kind of a, a way station that straddled the main highway. And so when Herod arrives in Bethlehem, it, it, intent on destroying this future rival, there's probably no more than 10 or 20 boys under the age of two. It's probably a small number, not a large number. And their deaths, certainly, they would have ripped the community apart. But they would barely have registered in the wider community. Because we need to remember who we're dealing with. We're dealing with Herod the Great. This was the man who murdered 300 priests when Rome gave him control of the province. He killed a brother-in-law, two wives, a mother-in-law, and three of his own sons. Uh, on one occasion, Herod captured a, a village during a time of, of uprising. Uh, he slew the rebels, and then he turned his sights on the peace-loving citizens, in order to set an example for the rest of the nation, he executed the remaining men, women, and children. He burnt their city to the ground. Just, just to communicate a message. This was the man who in the final hours of his life ordered the, the hippodrome to be filled with all the notable men of Jerusalem. So that when his death was announced... The people would mourn. They wouldn't celebrate his death. Herod's crimes, they were vast and they were many. Nevertheless, Matthew tells us that these things happened so that what had been spoken through Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. That a voice was heard in Ramah. Weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, and she refused to be comforted because they were no more. Here Matthew is repeating the teaching of Jeremiah chapter 31 verse 15. It's strange, I think, that, that a gospel writer would cite this particular passage, something that was written about 600 years ago uh, from the time of writing. Uh, it's strange because Ramah is a, a little town about five miles north of Jerusalem. Uh, so it's at least probably 13 miles from Bethlehem. And this was the place where the Babylonians gathered their Jewish captives. 
It was a staging point. It was a place from which they deported these people back to Babylon. And so here in Jeremiah's text, the the nation of Israel is represented as Rachel. Rachel was considered to be the mother of the nation. And so Israel is weeping over her lost loved ones. As such, the, the passage points to a time of terrible loss for the people. But that's actually not how the passage ends. And I think Matthew knows that. I think he, he recognizes that his audience knows that. Uh, he knows that they understand what's going to transpire after this particular text. So if you haven't done so, just put your finger in your Bible in Matthew's text and, and turn back to, to Jeremiah chapter 31. I want to see you to see what is taking place here. I want us to look at Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 16. So a voice is heard in Ramah, lamentation and bitter weeping. Rachel is weeping for her children. She refuses to be comforted for her children because they were no more. But after the sadness, look what comes next in verse 16. Thus says the Lord, restrain your voice from weeping and your eyes from tears. For your work will be rewarded, declares the Lord, and they will return from the land of the enemy. There is hope for your future, declares the Lord, and your children will return to their own territory. Uh, Drop down to verse 20. Is Ephraim my dear son? The answer is yes. Is he a Delightful child, of course. Indeed, as often as I have spoken against him, I certainly still remember him. Therefore, my heart yearns for him, and I will surely have mercy on him, declares the Lord. Matthew cites this passage because one day Israel's grief will be replaced by gladness. Sorrow will turn into celebration. Why? Because God is in the process of raising up a deliverer, one who is going to establish a new covenant with the nation of Israel. Look at what the prophet says then in verse 33. Jeremiah 31, verse 33. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them. And on their heart I will write it. And I will be their God. And they will be my people. They will not teach again each man his neighbor and each man his brother say, Know the Lord. Why? For they will all know me. From the least of them to the greatest of them, declares the Lord. I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. The pain that Israel is experiencing at the present moment in Matthew's gospel, it is part, it is part of God's eternal plan. It's not a mistake. It's not a cosmic blunder. This is God at work. He will use the tragedy of the moment, as he has in days past, to to further his agenda. And Jesus, even though he is small, even though he's a defenseless child at this point, he lies at the very center of that plan. Let's turn back to Matthew's Gospel. We've looked at the escape to Egypt the senseless slaughter in Bethlehem. Now I want to consider the new home in Nazareth. The new home in Nazareth. This occupies the balance of verses 19 to 23. So let's look at the text and and notice how it begins. But when Herod died, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph 
in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother and go to the land of Israel, for those who sought the child's life are dead. So Joseph got up, took the child and his mother, and came into the land of Israel. After maybe three or four years of living in exile, the angel of the Lord uh, here appears to Joseph for a third time. He commands the the small uh, family to go back. Herod the Great is no more. He has died a horrific death. Josephus describes it to us in his book on the antiquities of Israel. Uh, He almost presents it as as Herod rotting from the inside out. It's, It's bad. Just compensation for his atrocities. But once again, you'll notice that the response of this humble carpenter, it's instantaneous. There's no hesitation, no debate. Uh, no arguing that that another move is really going to disrupt the family unit, uh, that is going to take them away from the, this new life that they have established in this tropical oasis. You know, Joseph simply goes. He, he is the model of faith-filled obedience. And so he ventures back into the land of Israel. In some ways, I I don't think we should rush past that geographical marker there. Because in the eyes of Rome, Israel is no more. It doesn't exist. The land has been divided up into a number of provinces. Now there's Idumea and Judea and Samaria and Galilee and Perea and a couple other different provinces scattered around. In the minds of men, Israel is a thing of the past. But that's not God's plan. God has raised up his son. He's protected him. He's guided him. He's done so because in the words that we read in Matthew chapter 2, verse 6, he has promised to bring forth a ruler who will shepherd his people, who? Israel. A particular people can attach to a particular plot of land. But you'll notice as Israel or as Joseph crosses the border into the promised land, as he goes back into his native country, he is warned by God in a dream. He's probably intending to go back to do, to to Bethlehem. I mean, that's their ancestral home. That's where kind of the the, the family estate, if you want to put it that way, that that's where that is at. Uh, that would be a good location for him to to raise for them to raise their family but when he hears that Archelaus is reigning over the southern province of Judea his plans are changed and the intimation seems to be that it's the angel who is telling him to change those plans you need to understand Herod was a madman Archelaus was a monster He was the oldest surviving son uh, of Herod. He had all the rage of his father, but none of the restraint. Uh, For all of his atrocities, Herod was not a stupid individual. He was brilliant. Uh, He was the architect uh, of the ancient world. Uh, The man who built the Great Temple Mount. The man who built Masada. the, the, The man who built the Hippodrome and his palaces and all these sorts of things. The guy was absolutely brilliant. But just absolutely paranoid. But he could rein himself in. It doesn't seem, however, that his son had that same quality. Just by way of contrast, just before Herod died... Uh, He executed two popular rabbis because they they led a rebellion. Uh, They led the people to remove uh, 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 the symbol of the Roman eagle that that Herod had affixed to the temple gates. I mean, so this was radically offensive uh, to the Hebrew people. So it's very understandable that 
that these rabbis, these religious leaders are going to lead the people to, to remove that rather than suffer the indignity. Well, so Herod responds. He's not going to take this. So he executes the two rabbis. Well, the next year, when Archelaus is put onto the throne and another uprising begins, because these people are paying homage to these martyrs, he shows no self-restraint whatsoever. He executes over 2,000 Jews. Many of them are pilgrims to the promised land. They, they're not involved in the insurrection at all, in this rebellion at all. They are innocent bystanders, and yet Archelaus wipes them out. I mean, so this, this, this is not a good dude. Things are so bad that a delegation is sent to Rome. It includes the Jews. It includes Romans. It includes people from Archelaus' own family. And they plead with Rome to act. And so Caesar does. Uh, he, he removes the kingship from Archelaus. He becomes an ethnarch. That means he becomes a ruler of a half, a half of the, the, the kingdom. The rest of the kingdom is, is given to two of Herod's son and the proconsul uh, of Syria. They become uh, tetrarchs, uh, rulers of a fourth. They do this because when it came to Herod, people knew where to draw the line, roughly speaking, but, but with Archelaus, there is no line. He is a ticking time bomb and no one can see the time on the clock. He is just a raving lunatic. So Rome acts. Rome divides the land. And the dominion of Galilee is given to Herod Antipas. Herod Antipas is according to the historians the most able son of Herod the Great. In his quarter of the realm, he is going to main, maintain a time of relative peace and order that will last for about 40 years. It's no wonder then that the traveling couple are redirected to this northern province of Galilee. And once there, we're told that Joseph and Mary, they're going to settle in a city called Nazareth. From a human perspective, we really don't know why the parents of the Christ child selected this particular location. Maybe it's because they are familiar with that area, according to Luke's gospel. Uh, this was where, from where Joseph and Mary came. Uh, it could be that after three or four years of a hiatus, of not being able to work, Joseph is, is simply forced to go into this particular region because that's, that's where he can have gainful employment. That's where he can feed his family. So we don't know the human motivation, but the divine plan is clear. Look at the last part of verse 23. This happened that what was spoken through the prophets would be fulfilled. He shall be called a Nazarene. Now, if you type these words into your search engine or your Bible software, whatever you use to do that kind of stuff, you'll note that no prophet ever spoke these words. They're not found in the biblical text. Maybe, maybe some prophet did speak these words, they just weren't recorded. That is entirely possible. But I want you to note that, that Matthew does not point to a singular prophet. He points to multiple prophets. In doing so, I think Matthew is not referring then to one particular text. Rather, he is painting a composite picture from the wider testimony of Scripture. We know that the Nazarenes were despised people. Nazareth, as a, as a city, as a town, it was located about 55 miles north of Jerusalem, and the city had a bad reputation. 
Her citizens were noted for their cruelty, for their violence. Uh, and because Nazareth housed uh, the Roman garrison that control, controlled the, the northern provinces, the people were viewed as co-conspirators. They were sellouts to the nation of Israel. They were compromisers. That's why Nathaniel responds the way he does in John chapter 1. Being from the city of Cana, it was just a, a few miles south of Nazareth. Nathaniel was well aware of the city's nefarious character. And so when he, so when he asked, can anything good come out of Nazareth? He's making a statement that is known to the people. It seems to be that this is the characterization that Matthew really wants to point at. Rather than looking at a particular text that refers to the city where Jesus grew up and learned a trade, the gospel writer references a group of texts which point to Jesus as one who is going to be looked down upon. In Isaiah 53, the, the prophet predicts that the suffering servant will be despised and rejected by men. In Psalm 22, the Messiah speaks, declaring himself to be a reproach of men, despised by the people. Uh, in the very next line, in, in Psalm 22, verse 7, he says, All those who see me, they ridicule me. This is the point of a, a number of different passages in the Old Testament. Passages like Psalm 69, verses 20 and 21, Isaiah 49, verse 7. We read that earlier. Uh, Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. Jesus would be a man of lowly stature in the eyes of the world. And here's the point. This has not happened by accident. It means that Jesus didn't pour himself into a particular mold. He didn't make himself a Nazarene in order to portray himself as something he had no right to claim. No, these things happened when Jesus was an infant. These things didn't happened because his parents searched the scriptures. They identified particular points of comparison and then set to set out to, to claim the, the throne for their son by fulfilling these prophecies. No. It was God through the angel who commanded them to do certain things or to go to certain places. I think Chuck Swindoll states the matter well. In his commentary on this text, he writes this. He says, throughout this series of upheaval in the early life of Jesus, we clearly see the providential and protective hand of God who provided for the family of the Messiah in amazing ways. God gave supernatural guidance just when it was needed most. And most, or more importantly, Matthew repeatedly points out how the seemingly disjointed reactionary movements of Joseph and his family were anything but a desperate attempt by God to stay ahead of the forces of evil. Rather, Matthew shows us how the events of the life of Christ fulfilled Old Testament types and parallels and prophecies beautifully. From Bethlehem to Egypt, he writes, to Nazareth, Joseph heard God's leading. He trusted his guidance. He obeyed his word. Jesus isn't a king because he faked his way onto the throne. He's there because God guided and guarded him according to his own eternal plans and purposes. That's, that's a message we need to hear and we need to understand. If you've been listening to the news that has been coming out of the States for the you know, last week or two, 
there's been a lot of discussion about politicians who aren't all that they make themselves out to be. Uh, people who are misrepresenting themselves to the public. Uh, we've learned of one member of the, the House of Representatives, a Republican, a man from the state of New York, uh, who's been exposed uh, in the last week uh, because he's lied about his ethnic background, his family history, uh, his education, uh, his work experience. I mean, you name it, it's created out of whole cloth. That is not a person you can trust. The legitimacy of his position is called into question. And yet the same cannot be said of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He is the legitimate King of kings and Lord of lords. And we have seen this reflected in the fact that God the Father has guarded him and guided him from the earliest days. He is God's anointed one. He is the divine Messiah. One who can be trusted. One who must be obeyed. Let's pray together. Father, we do thank you for your son. We thank you that he's not a fraud. Some man-made invention that we are to put our hope and trust in but will fail in the moment of testing. We thank you that your son is as real as real can be. That he is the creator and sustainer of all things. That he is the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. Father, that as our ruler, he has authority over all things. And so we pledge our allegiance to him once again, knowing that we can trust him, knowing that what he says is true and right and just. Father, we commit ourselves to him as his servants. Longing to be faithful disciples who bring him honor and glory and praise. So we pray these things in his name. Amen.